Today on The State of Us, how will 60-year careers work? Welcome to the State of Us. I'm your host, Justin T. Weller, joined today by the one and only your friendly redneck liberal and the senior resident historian here at True Chat, Mr. Lance Jackson. As people live longer, healthier lives, the traditional 40-year career will become a thing of the past. But that's going to require a new mindset and a lot more planning. Uh Uh-oh, Lance. Looks like you got to work longer. Does that depress you? No, I don't. You do. Oh, okay. According to well, social- according to this, you're going to die soon. Yeah, according so to Social Security, I, I've got four more years you're, left. You're on the way out. Yeah, so I won't get to 40. Well, actually, I will, because I started... Well, it depends on when you count. I mean, yeah, wait, 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 wait. You I'll can be, be at 40 right now. I'll, if I'll be close to 60, yeah. I mean, I started delivering newspapers at 12. Yeah. So if I die at 66, you know, it's still a, what, 50... It was pretty good. 54-year career? Pretty good run. Yeah, I had a good run. Well, I want to ask you, are you, are you a little sad? That you got to work for 60 years now? I don't know. I've never really had this like notion that, like, I know these people in my life that are retired. I'm like, man, that seems like that'd be nice. I'm probably never going to get to do that. Everybody that I know younger than me, all three people that I know are yeah. younger than me, they think it's cool that I'm retired yeah. and getting to choose to do what I want to do. See, I don't consider myself retired. Yeah. Because I still work. Right. I mean, I, I work, you know, I, I work at the youth center and I work here. So- yeah. To me, I'm still <laughs> working, right? I I'm don't. Not retired. I'm not retired. You retired from your career, and you aren't dependent upon any of these things to put food on the table. Well, that's because I invested my money wisely. I, right. I'm not saying that it's a bad thing. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm then, just saying that. But then, why do all you millennials and and Gen Zers say you're never going to get to retire? Well, because why, why do you look at me with jealous? green envied eyes like well, i'm never gonna get to do what you're doing well we talked i mean that's a different show wealth creation and oh. i mean sort of why is this happening is not necessarily the show okay so why so doing. why is there okay so why is there an article about a 60-year career then i mean this is the show then isn't about why it is but that it's going to happen and so how should you plan for it right well okay but right. but why i mean the the brief touch point on why right is that people are living longer like i mean one of the things yeah, that's rub in it this in. article go ahead rub it is, in go right ahead. i mean maybe not you but uh, yeah. there are people living longer i got you. so <laughs> most of our listeners are probably closer to you in age than they are to me so uh we could be in trouble is what keep that, breathing that <laughs> keep breathing that air folks take it away from these young whippersnappers but the the life expectancy component, you're the one that pointed this out on the chart. For those of you that were born, for example, in the 1960s, if you were a male, life expectancy somewhere probably around 66, female probably somewhere around 73. Um, so that is what you're looking at. If I if I fast forward to the 90s when I was born, uh, now we're looking at males sitting at closer to 72, uh, maybe a little higher than that, 73. And females sitting, uh, you know, just below 80, probably 80 or 79. Um, so, and then if we fast forward to people being born today, 82 for females, 77 for males. So the point is life expectancy keeps going up. People are living longer. And so why do, why is this changing from a more typical 40 year career that we've all been sold on to 60? Well, people are living longer and whether or not we like to think about it, at some point, there's probably a decent chance that the age for Social Security is going to, you know, be increased again. So the 60-year career, here it comes. There are a number of points from this pretty in-depth Wall Street Journal piece. But Lance, what was your first one? Lifelong learning might become a thing, right? That was it. I mean, Is former, it not a thing right now? Former teacher. Would well, it be essential? And I, and I remembered that, you know, because when I started teaching, I was using a mimeograph machine and an opaque machine and reel-to-reel showing movies in my classroom. Okay. And some and, of our and, audience doesn't know what any of those exactly. things are. Exactly. And I ended with showing YouTube videos on a whiteboard from my computer. And so that was pretty high tech. And that was, you know, for, for a 30-year career, that's what I started with sure. to what sure. I ended with. So there was constant learning going on within the field of education as far as technology was concerned and how to apply it in the classroom just to learn the technology and then how to use it. But if you're going to then work another 
30 years, right? If you're going to work 60 years out in the world, well, we all know that it's hard enough now to stay up to date with technology, but adding another 20 years to your career, then the situation becomes even more daunting. And what you may also want to do is who wants to stay in the same job for 60 years? So there might be times when you're going to go back to school to start a brand new career. And anecdotally in the article, it is about a 38-year-old young woman, and I say young woman because I'm older, but a 38-year-old woman who decides at that point in her life, she wants to become a lawyer. And so she's entered in law school at the age of 38. She says, why should I care that I'm going to become a lawyer at 40? My dad and my, my grandfather were both medical doctors, and they worked well into their 70s. So if I become a lawyer in my 40s, I've got 25, 30 years to be a lawyer. So education, either staying in the same field, you have to keep up with, with new ideas that are being developed, or if you're going to be working for 60 years, you may want to work at one job for 10 or 15 years and another job for 10 or 15 years. So you may be going back to school you know, periodically within your lifetime to train for an entirely different career because you don't want to be bored doing the same thing for 60 years. I think we'd be hard pressed to find any of our listeners who could say that their job hasn't changed at all, even over a, even over a 10 or five year period, let alone 60, you know? Well, think of me working with my grandfather as a, as a young man working on a car and there was enough room inside the engine that you could almost climb inside the engine and work from the inside out to where now it's all electronics and they've really designed them to where you can't fix your own car because you can't get to it. You have to take off too many pieces. And the diagnostic, well, the technicians today, they don't even call them mechanics, the technicians hook it up to a computer. And now we're coming into a new phase of electric vehicles which means all of those auto mechanics are going to have to learn a whole new system just so that we can all keep driving. I think the theme that's kind of recurring throughout this is obviously if you're going to have a 60-year career, there's just not a lot of careers that it's probably likely you're going to stay in a single career in the same job for 60 years, right? Maybe you're going to stay in the same like field, but to to and and even that's probably not super likely, right? I mean, you think about a lot of different, you know, people and it's like, well, you could say, I mean, if you take Lance, for example, um, you know, maybe you could say spent 30 years in sort of the traditional education system, but you had a couple jobs before that. You're still in education, but not in the same job that you were in before. Well, learning a whole, whole new system. Right. I, I never worked with the with the GED yeah. before. And mm-hmm. so I've had to learn how it works and the way they ask questions right. and the way you test skills students. that you developed and experience that you had, but you're learning a new job uh, with, to put those skills in it. A lot of learning use. taking place. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess that's kind of the underlying theme as we talk about all this is it's just not very realistic to expect somebody's going to probably spend 60 years and never change pursuits. We've already talked about how millennials as a generation, and obviously the generations following us like Gen Z, are going to be more transient, just generally speaking, uh, but particularly with jobs. Uh, you know, they're going to have a lot of different jobs. And, and part of that is not just that they're going to bounce around more, it's that they're going to be working longer. So therefore, they'll have more jobs because they'll be in the workforce longer, probably. Um, Less than 10% right now, Lance, of the Fortune 500 companies have re-entry programs for employees who have taken career breaks for family caregiving or other reasons, according to research um, by a Boston firm called iRelaunch, which encourages employers to establish such programs and helps people return to work after breaks of 1 to 20 years. This section, so we talked about continuing education, is called the glide path. Um, And this is this idea kind of that we've been talking about um, that expect basically that the career is probably going to resemble more of a jungle gym rather than a ladder. And what do we mean by that? Well, you might go side to side. You might jump off for a while, then hop back on. Um, When we say a 60-year career, it doesn't necessarily mean 60 consecutive years either, right? 
uh, especially as we see now that there are more people who are spending part of their life as a caregiver for somebody else, the question becomes, maybe that's something that companies need to build in is saying, we've invested this time and energy in you to train you up for this thing. You have things going on in your life you want to leave. Well, the way it typically works right now is bye, see ya. Um, Correct. And there really is no, there is no like, well, we hope you come back someday. I mean, right. maybe they say that, but there's not really like any kind of formalized plan or in process. In education, we call it taking a sabbatical. Yeah. But that usually doesn't work in right. the... For all those people with real jobs who aren't in education, yeah. they, they don't get that, they don't do they don't get that term sabbatical. of a sabbatical. Okay. Meaning, <laughs> meaning you get to leave work for a year or two and then come back and right. get your job back. Gotcha. Yeah, that, there it is. So it, it is exists, right? I mean, there are people that uh, that do that kind of thing. But in mo- in a lot of career fields, that doesn't that doesn't exist right now, or at least, again, not in a formalized sense. So the notion is, well, maybe that needs to start coming into play more. And how would that work for companies? Well, we're going to talk about that and some other ways that the 60-year career could work. Keep it here on The State of Us. We'll be right back. The Wall Street Journal article we're referencing suggests that employees should imagine a career that involves making leaps sideways and across rungs rather than straight climb upwards. Miss Jap says that she learned to expect this by observing her parents who both lost corporate jobs in midlife and then successfully pivoted to self-employment. Her father, after a career in advertising, established a stamp and coin selling business on eBay, and her mother became an independent advisor to art collectors after working as an executive at a large art gallery. Um, The idea of portfolio careers and change being a positive um, was implanted in me early, Ms. Japp says. Over any career, but especially a lengthy one, you need to cope with two ever-changing variables. First is the business world where new companies and many new jobs will be constantly emerging. And second, personally, we change over time. So do our interests and curiosity. I thought that one was an important component of the glide path. Mm -hmm. Sometimes taking a break may not just be to do another thing like raise a kid or take care of an older parent or something like that. It may also be to figure out what's next. Um, And maybe you find that yeah, I, one of the reasons I feel burnt out is I don't really like doing this anymore. Not that I didn't like doing it, right? but I'm not happy doing it now. So now I want to do something else. You want a new challenge. Right. You, you want a new perspective mm-hmm. on things. You know, the only thing I have, a question I really have, and maybe you can answer it for me, is what do you do in that in-between time? I mean, if we're talking about wage gap and not making enough money, so you decide after 20 years... You want to switch gears. Do you save up money so that you can be educated to do that? Um, do you go into debt and then work to pay it off? Because you know you're going to work to your, you know, to your 70s anyway, so it's not like, I'm going to be paying back this school debt until I'm 65. Well, so what? You're working until you're 75. I, 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 I don't mean that in a bad, but you know what I'm saying? Right. All of a sudden it doesn't make any, I wouldn't have wanted to pay back school debt. Until I was 65. Sure. Because, you know, I knew I was going to be able to retire uh, much younger than that. But if you know you're going to be working longer, so is it okay to take on the school debt? Do you save money from your other career? I mean, most people don't do that, right? So, or you just, bam, flip the switch and go to a new career and try to keep up your same lifestyle. Or does your lifestyle change? I know I said I'd ask you a question, but I just asked you about four. <laughs> right, I was going to say that was several so, questions, but take it wherever I, you want, though. But I, I mean, I, I can I I see where yes, this will happen. But how would it? How do you think it was? It's going to play out? Well, I think there's a there's a couple things that happen. I mean, one is a societal shift, right? To the point of individually, as more people become aware of like I'm going to be working longer, they're probably going to need to think more about like. Uh, you know, am I going to save for these interim periods where I may need to take a break? Am I going to change investing strategies because of that? And if you're not, if you're not in a career or job where that's a realistic thing, you know, for you to really uh, lean on, then I also think it's something where just holistically we have to talk about, should we be rethinking 
what retirement looks like. And maybe it's not so much retirement's mostly pretty linear right now for a lot of people in terms of you work and then you stop full-time work and now you're retired and maybe you volunteer or do some side jobs, but like, and then you, you're retired until you die. You know I mean? That's the traditional sort of linear path. And, and maybe what we're discovering is the more historically correct idea of not correct, but the more historically accurate idea of retirement only being a few years before you die returns, but we're going to have some sabbaticals over your working career of a few years here or there. And yeah, that requires different financial planning, um, both from a, both from a employer standpoint. But the other thing that I think ties in and the article doesn't mention this, this is just supposition on my part is if you're going to develop re-entry plans, maybe part of that is like a more structured, like you're going to be gone for two years, you know? Um, And when you come back, we'll see what positions are open and based on what you did for us before, how you're going to re-enter. But you're committed to coming back. We know you're coming back. Like that's, it's all planned that way. and And it maybe allows companies, they're already spending the money you know, for companies that offer some kind of retirement or pension plan, they're already spending that money in a way. Uh, So it's just a, how does it get reshuffled? I think there's a much larger conversation than about is social security really still structured appropriately if we're going to move toward that type of society and workforce that says, I'm never really, nobody's going to retire for 25 years. That's not going to happen. But you may retire for the last five to 10 years of your life, and you may take collectively another 10 to 15 years over the course of a 60-year career, making it closer to more like 40 years of actual work and 60 years of a working life. Which is what Social Security was originally set up for back in the Great Depression. Um, You know, I was thinking about this, but so if my generation historically has this generational wealth and you mentioned one of the reasons you might take a sabbatical is to take care of an elderly parent could some of the money that the elderly parents have accrued over the years then be drawn as a living expense for the child that's taking care of them i mean right i mean i know now that a lot of children use that money that their parents have to pay for the care right for the elderly person if you're not going to pay somebody else you could take it over and then draw a salary from from that right i mean i'm trying to think of i mean you're going to pay somebody to do it right Right. i mean that's kind of the thinking somebody's going to get paid to do this it's a question Mm -hmm. of if you're not at the place where you need the level of care of a professional or if you'd prefer to have the care of family and your family's willing to do it Why would you not pay them if you'd pay somebody else? But if you knew you were going to work for 60 years, then I'm going to take that sabbatical from work because I want to spend time with my loved one as much as I can before they go on and you're okay. And and maybe that's how you provide for your sustenance and existence during that sabbatical, which is one of my questions towards you. So, I mean, it's kind of an answer that as you were talking, I kind of thought, well, you know, if we're getting blamed for having all this money, then our money could pay for our children to take that sabbatical. Well, and paid family leave continues to obviously generate some steam and momentum. But even more than that, I think about somebody who I work with, um, who's not technically an employee, but contracts with our company. Um, I mean, she figured out that like, it was actually cheaper for her to work less hours every week and be able to then take care of her children at the right times of day so as to not have to pay for childcare. In other words, only working 25 hours a week while my gross pay is less, the net pay is actually better because I'm the one that gets to take care of my children and I'm not paying exuberant costs for childcare. Um, So, I mean, obviously that's, again, that's a personal choice, but I think when we talk about the economics of it, it's not always, well, how do I get paid for that time, but also... How do I not spend as much during that time? Sure. Because if it, it, both can be true. Maybe I'm still, and that's the other thing of, maybe it's not two years of no work, right? Maybe it's, well, I was putting in 40 or 45 hours a week, and now I'm putting in 20 hours a week. 
And I think in a lot of ways, that's it's it's almost like we're already kind of seeing that because there's a lot of people. I mean, you're not the only one that I know who they've retired and then they kind of try to take it easy for a little bit. And then it's like, well, I want to do something. I don't really want to do 40 or 50 or 60 hours a week, but I, w- I want to do, I want to work some. And and we have several, I mean, really, we have several of those people at the youth center. Half right. of the youth center workforce are people that retired who decided that they didn't want to be fully retired. You know, they, they want to still do something. Well, to that, to that point, when people say, well, why would you work until you're 70 or 75, you know? Well, because speaking from that, I retired from my first career at 54. I wasn't done living. I still felt like I had more to give society, but I get to give it now on my terms rather than feeling like I have to go in right. and go to a certain place. And so if I was going to live and if I do break you know, what Social Security says I will make and I get to live to be 80 or so, I probably will continue to volunteer or work at something into my 70s just because, you know, I mean, right now, as far as my health and everything, I'd keep going another 10 years doing what I'm doing, which would put me into my early 70s. So I, in that respect, I can see this 60-year career. Yeah. Well, and that's what I guess it's kind of the thing of like it's already sort of starting to happen, but there's not necessarily – the model yet of like, this is how one could do it. It's sort of like, here are ways people are figuring out sort of kind of how to do it. Right. Because when I was your age, you know, 30 years ago, it was, well, if I'm going to, I'm going to work this hard, do this, put this much money away. And then at this age, I'm done. Yeah. So there was a model for me to chase. Yeah. You know, you can do this thing right? and it'll yield this 60 year career is still kind of being shaped. So there's not necessarily a model to follow. So you guys are pioneers trying to figure out how this is all going to work. Well, and the next one that you want to talk about is the notion of if we're going to take care of these older people, right? Younger people, maybe taking time to take care of older people. um, There's more intergenerational stuff going on. How does that play into a 60 year career? Exactly. Well, it's like you and me. I mean, you know, I, I, I was retired and, you know, had done some subbing and taught at the college and, you know, done some different things and just kind of hung out. Then all of a sudden you and some associates of yours decided to start a youth center and you came to me and said, Hey, how would you like to help me get this started? And so, yeah, I were, and again, intergenerational, right? Right. I I was done. You came to me because you and I, you know, had contact and, and had remained gone from a student teacher relationship to a friend relationship. And I said, well, sure, I'll help you lay it all out. And after I laid it all out, you offered me a job. And I said, no, I don't want a job. (laughs) And then, you know, you you found some other people, but you kept me informed and I kind of served as a mentor. And then you finally said, I said, well, you know what? Well, maybe I'll work a little bit, you know, and then. And so again, but it's by having those contacts, the, the fact that one, when you quit being my student, you continued to reach out to me, but by the same token, I retired and didn't shut you out. Right. I still stayed in contact with you. It, so opportunities, you know. And then I have uh, a couple of friends who I coach their daughters, and sometimes I do landscaping work with them. And they're in their 40s, right. you know, but that's a different generation than mm-hmm. you. Because especially, you know, as, as, as younger people change or move into something else, while it may not have made sense before for somebody to be involved in something, they may think, oh, hey, I know this person and they'd be great. You know, I wonder what they're doing and they may be looking for something. So, Well, the one thing the older folks have is experience. Yeah, We maybe don't have the stamina to put in the hours that the younger folks do, but we have experience that they can draw on that we make their jobs easier. And when we step in, we maybe don't work as many hours, but we get more work done. Because we have the experience. So we don't have to trial and error. We right. know what works and what doesn't work. And so you hire us and we don't go through a learning curve to be productive. You can bring us in and we're immediately productive. Right. Well, and, and not just that too, but also where people fit at different stages in their life in terms of what they want to do or what they're capable of doing. They can provide that insight and wisdom, but maybe they don't really want to be the one doing that job. They'd be happy to advise. Very true, right. But, for example, maybe they're more comfortable 
being the janitor. You know, I I want to help because I I know having worked in jobs my whole life how important this person is. So I don't mind doing it because I don't see it as grunt work, but it's going to be easier for me to do because I'm not going to get as tired as fast or worn out by doing this. So I could do this thing. But then if you need help or advice, I'd be happy to lend you that. You know, so I think there's those kinds of opportunities, too, of saying just because they're not willing to do the job that they became great at doing doesn't mean that there's not other ways that they are still but that's valuable. Only, but that only happens if you those keep the contacts yep. throughout your life. Yep. Exactly. So there's a couple more to talk about, uh, along with um, the civilian labor force participation rate, which we did a show on recently, but talking about how that plays into longer careers as well. Keep it here on The State of Us. We'll be right back. The share of Americans 55 and up who are in the workforce is growing as the ranks of older Americans swell amid a long-term jump in life expectancy. One of the um, telling things here is the civilian labor force participation rates by age. As you would expect, the 25 to 54-year-olds, of which a majority are millennials, makes up um, the largest portion of those participating in the labor force sitting uh, basically at, at above 80%, uh, both back in 2001, in 2011, in 2021, and what's projected for 2031. They expect 25 to 54-year-olds uh, to maintain above 80% participation in the labor force. The interesting thing is that when you start looking at the numbers for 55 to 64, 65 to 74, 75 and older, all of those are projecting by 2031 higher participation rates than they see today. So, or even back in 2001. In 2001, those 65 and older, uh, the participation rate was only at 20%. So, 80% of people who were 65 or older in 2001 were not participating in the labor force. Uh, and for 75, it was about 5%. Now, when you look at how that's going to change by 2031, so just three decades, uh, the projection there is that for those 65 to 74-year-olds, you're going to be above 30%, and for 75 and older, you're going to be above 10%. Um, so like with the 75 and older, that number is going to double is the projection, and for 65 to 74, it's going to go from 20% to maybe like 31%, 32%. It just is amazing to me that in... 2001, the number of 16 to 24 year olds was almost 65, 66 percent, and by 2031 they're saying it's going to drop to 50 percent. Well, so that age group, I mean, mm -hmm. is not, and, and even to the 25 to 54. Because you say, well, they're just going to go into that 25 to 54. That's why they're dropping. Even the 25 to 54 age group in 2031 is lower than it was in 2001 and basically stays the same as it was in 2011 and 2021. Right. So there's not the young workers coming in. Now, part of that is they're not as big a group, but it's a percentage of them going to work. There's just not as many of them going to work. Well, and I would think too, the 25 to 54 year olds probably represent some of what we're talking about on this episode is that over time, we're expecting that participation rate, not drastically to drop because if we talk, that's prime working age, that 25 to 54, you know, but it goes from like where it was sitting in 2001, it may be, you know, 84% um, down to like 81% by 2031. Well, what's happening with those couple? Why, why is it going that way when the older groups are going up? Well, Yes, there's the number changes, but I think also what you're going to see in there is some of what we're talking about, which is that notion of people who are not participating at the time were measuring something, you know. In other words, they're not done participating, but they're, but making they're a not career participating yeah. right at that Currently. moment. Okay. Right. Um, likewise, you know, we're also seeing um, this kind of reworking and rethinking of like, what is post high school? Is it college for everybody? And a lot of times we're seeing, we talked about this too, the average time people are spending in college has increased. So if you go, not necessarily whether or not you're more likely to go to college, but if you end up going to college, the amount of time you're likely to spend 
in higher education over the course of your life is higher than it used to be. So the other thing that could be happening here is that we're seeing there's just not as many people who are working full time until after they're 25, simply because they're staying in college longer. That makes sense. So what what do you have left for us to end the show on? What What's the final point we want to make here on this change in style as far as work is concerned from a 40 year work career to a 60 year work career? Well, the other thing I think that it was key here, and basically these are two points that kind of go together, one that you marked and one that I did, continue exploring possible new paths, even when you're enjoying your current career. And then yours was don't try to plan it all out. And I think those go hand in hand. Um, You should keep yourself open to possibilities because just because you like what you're doing doesn't mean that you may not like doing something else better, you know? Um, Likewise, even if you like what you're doing, you may not be able to do the thing you're doing forever, whether that's physically, mentally, or just because the job could get eliminated, you know? So just because things are sailing smooth doesn't mean that you shouldn't open yourself to the possibility of, well, what if I wasn't doing this, what else might I do? But see, that to me, that's a big change in mindset. Yeah. So that, that is a big part of this. Mm-hmm. Because when I started teaching, I basically marked the calendar and said, okay, at this time in this year, I'll be eligible to retire. Right. Because I knew what my retirement system was and, mm-hmm. and what I could do. Well, so like you, so it, everything it I mapped. did over that 30-year period was aimed at being able to retire then. But with this, so it's a whole paradigm shift, right? Now that when I look at it, it's like, no, I don't necessarily know when I'm going to retire. So I'm going to keep my options open. And even though I enjoy what I'm doing, there may come a time when I want to do something else. In addition to your point of, well, you may not be able to do what you're doing now. So you need to keep looking for other things to do. Right. Well, and just the difference too of planning a 30-year retirement track in a single field is mm-hmm. not the same as attempting to plan a 60-year retirement track in a single field. Exactly. Um, because, you know, it's just not. <laughs> it's I mean, it's literally twice as long. So, yes, a 40-year career was more typical, but we also look at very few people spent 40 years in the same job. 30 years tended to be kind of the top end of what most people would spend. And that also was what a lot of retirement systems have been based on is that 30-ish your range of in a career. But even with that, it changed Mm -hmm. and is now a 35-year career. Like my my daughter went into education the exact same year that I retired. To do the same thing that I do, she's now required at least currently to work five more years to get the same benefits that I did, which means we're we're starting to see that, you know, 10 years ago, see that paradigm shift already. Right. It's saying, okay, you're in the same field but you're going to have to work, you know, 15% longer right. to get the same benefits. Well, unlike if you're in an education field, right, or just a more traditional field that offers a standard kind of, you know, retirement plan that's set up that way. Well, if it's bumped up to 35, but you're going to be working for 60 years, I mean, really, that's your, if it was 40 and you were at 30 years and now at 60 and you're at 35 years, like you're still going to do other things. So the notion of being able to plan it all out is probably not realistic either. Yeah. You can't plan it all out and you need to, you know, don't burn any bridges. Right. Because you never know who you might go back to How it comes later around. and, you know, need help from or who might offer you a, a different career when you're looking for it to change. The the other thing that comes to mind with that is highlighting the importance of connections and relationships, right? Don't burn the bridges, but also be very open to meeting people and, and keeping up with connections, even if you don't know right at that moment how they could be valuable or how you could help each other, you don't know when they might be. Um, and if you're going to be working longer and you're going to have a longer career, it's probably not going to hurt anything. You know? Exactly. Uh, it, maybe they won't become useful, but they might, you know, and you just don't know when or if. Right, exactly. You don't know when, or, or uh, but they they could very likely like you. There was no youth center when I when I was your teacher. Right? Yeah, I mean, there so was, wasn't even. It would have been option. impossible to have planned that because it just didn't exist. Exactly. Um, and and I, that's part of the point here too is. If you try to plan it all out, you may also inadvertently then close yourself off to exploring other possibilities because, you know, it's like, oh, well, this thing came along, but that's not part of my plan. So I'm just not going to look at it. 
you don't, we don't even, I mean, we don't know on this show. You don't know. Nobody knows what jobs are going to be available 60 years from now. You know, you just don't. So like, you also don't want to say, well, this is what I'm going to do and I'm not going to vary from and that. Then I'm going to switch to this one. And then at age right. 55, I'm going to switch to this one. Uh, they may, one may of those jobs may not exist. Right. right. And there may become another job that was like, oh, I'd be really good at that. So we're interested in doing it and feel fulfilled to do that. Yeah. I think it's changing. I mean, I guess if, if the question comes down to is it good or bad, um, I'm not going to say that it's really either. I, I think that it's different. You know, uh, people are living longer. We, That's fair. We face new challenges and we also then have to rethink how are we going to spend our non-work time? And I think that's part of what we've seen just with the millennials and all this debate that's been had about, you know, their notion of work-life balance and the importance of that and why. Some of it, I think, plays into this. They may not be able to say it, but they're thinking about, well, if I never end up with that 20-year retirement, then I don't want to wait and then never get it. I need to take this vacation. I need to have these events in my life and take a couple of days off to travel to this concert or to see these museums because I'm not going to get to do that when I turn 65 because uh, I'm going to continue to work. So I'm going to go now and have those experiences because I'm going to be working in my later years, whereas my parents or grandparents got to travel the world. Right. Check out and kind of, you know, so it's, again, is it really it's different, but it really, you accomplish a lot of the same things. Exactly. It, it's just, uh, you see the same things, you just do it in a different way. The way it's going to be done may have to change as people work longer. Um, so yeah, I think, it, I think it's very interesting and it'll be, it'll be very, very curious to see how it all develops because, you know, again, a lot of this is supposition. We really don't know how any of it's going to go. Um, but I think the changes to our retirement, the way we think about retirement are going to have to take place. I think they're already taking place. Well, that's place. why you can't plan it out. Right. Because you don't know if it's going to, how it's going to all play out in the end. Yep. So why we have this show today, Lance, what was the point? Well, because we work at this place called True Chat, and True Chat has a mission. And that mission is to educate people by providing honest, open, and respectful conversations. And hopefully you've enjoyed today's show and you share it with others. And if those others would like to listen to us, they can find us as a podcast on Spotify, Overcast, Stitcher, Apple Podcast, and everywhere podcasts are found. The State of Us is available, uh, releasing new episodes. <laughs> Sorry, folks, Lance. Uh, he made it through his read seamlessly, but I wasn't going to make it through mine because his glasses fell off halfway through, and I was just thinking, oh, there's a boomer. <laughs> Struggling with those reading glasses. Uh, anyway... I don't have reading glasses yet, but probably someday. Maybe they'll maybe they'll figure out something else other than reading glasses by the time I get there. The State of Us releases new episodes Tuesdays and Thursdays as a podcast. Those same episodes heard on the weekends on AM and FM radio stations across the United States and parts of Canada. For the State of Us, I'm Justin T. Weller. I'm Lance Jackson. Special thanks to producer Bradley Butch. Hey, we do have a member of Gen Z on the show. We do. He just didn't get to talk. <laughs> Thank you all, our audience, for tuning in, as it should be. <laughs> We'll see you next time. Be the change. Be sure to check out our website, thestateofus.org, for books, articles, and all the ways to tune in. Thestateofus.org.